and it took me over an hour to do 10 laps. I was just in that bad of shape and that sick. Yeah. But I wasn't going to quit until I had my 10 laps done. And this is why I was so excited to be on your podcast. We do the hard thing. One of the things my dad's always taught me is, okay, get to your limit, then see if you can do one more. So I got to 10. It took me over an hour. I'm gasping and I'm like, no, you got to do one more. So I did 11. I'm Mark Drager. And as an entrepreneur and strategist, I've built a multi-million dollar marketing agency. I've helped launch startups and transformed international brands. And yet, despite all the success, I still wake up every morning with the feeling that I'm just not good enough. And I've not come close to hitting my potential. And I may never achieve the high hopes that I have for myself. I believe that we all have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to the voices in our own heads. And so each week, I share real, tactical advice and the most interesting and inspiring interviews because my goal is to help those of us who have something to prove show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. Welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast. Today's guest is an extreme distance swimmer who was told in his early 50s that he was going to die that the lymphoma and the leukemia that was attacking his body would win out. And then, just to make matters worse, just before his 30th wedding anniversary, his wife, who was also battling a terminal illness, suddenly passed. And in that dark period, when he felt that he had nothing to live for, he found an inner strength. He refused to accept a death sentence and against doctor's orders, took matters into his own hands. There's a quote from Albert Einstein that reads, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle and the other is though everything is a miracle. Our next guest believes that adopting this quote as a standard to live by not only saved his life, but put the pieces in place to win the fight against cancer, as well as help him put his life back together. I can't wait to share with you the conversation I had with the man who may have cured himself of cancer through cold water swimming, Dean Hall. Okay, uh, well, listen, Dean is yeah. a coach. He's a speaker. He happens to be a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist. Now, that may have been your day job for a very long time, but uh, <laughs> what I'm most- years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, does that make you feel old, man? Yeah, really old. <laughs> well, so, so here's what I'm most curious about. And the thing that I think most people want to ask you about you're right. also an extreme distance swimmer. Sure. Okay, so I've looked into that. How mm-hmm. the hell does anyone decide I am going to become an extreme distance swimmer? Like, how do you get sucked into that world? Yeah, uh, sucked into that world is a great way of putting it because I don't think you choose your dreams. I think your dreams choose you. And uh, I always liked endurance events. Uh, my mother and father, I. I grew up here in Oregon in the Pacific Northwest, and both my mom and my dad were mountain climbers. Uh, I tell everybody before there were adventure athletes, there were Oregonians. Um, And, uh, you know, so uh, at 10, I climbed uh, Mount Hood, the state's uh, highest mountain. And I remember my dad, I'm 10 years old, okay, haven't hit puberty, haven't even thought about puberty, didn't know what puberty was. And he's like, you tired? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, good, good. This will develop some grit. Okay. So (laughs) I'm I'm 10, dad. (laughs) Yeah. So this, this, this came early on to you then. Like this was just just part of the family makeup. Like it, it did. It's kind of in the DNA, but more importantly, uh, when I chose to swim my first really long distance, Uh, I mean, I did triathlons throughout the 80s and 90s, and I thought I was good, Um, but I, I, you know, I was mid-pack. But when I decided to swim the Willamette River, I was dying. I was pretty sure this was going to be my last big swing. And my oncologist told me, hey, Dean, you get in this river, you might not make it to the end of the river. And so I really wanted to leave the world courageously. So quick yeah. backstory. So you're in your fifties sure. and um, you just mentioned I am, you were I sick. I just turned 60. 
Oh, uh, but I was in my 50s then, yeah. You were diagnosed with lymphoma, uh, sorry, lymph lymphoma and leukemia. Right. I, I try to combine those in my words. <laughs> hey, I like it better. <laughs> do you? And, uh, and so you're, you're facing um, death. I mean, ultimately, right. right? The doctor says, this is not, this is not good. And no. so you think, hell, I'm just going to go ahead and do something incredibly hard or difficult or, or, or well, to be a little more concrete for your listeners. What had happened was three years before I lost my first wife uh, to brain cancer. And once it was diagnosed 52 days later, she was gone 15 days for our 30th anniversary. And so I just lost I, <laughs> the ironic thing, Mark, is I was considered in the Midwest a grief expert. And I found out, uh, yeah, uh, life experience is much different and much more real than uh, book knowledge. But uh, I, I felt like I didn't know anything. I made every possible mistake. I lost my will to live. And my daughter was in her senior year uh, when, when my wife died. And so just a few years later, 2013, fast forward to 2013, uh, I am alone. Uh, I had moved to Kansas uh, for this cute little Kansas farm girl that I married and put myself in exile for love in her small town for 30 years. But Kansas without the cute little Kansas girl is Kansas. So I moved back to Oregon. Uh, but not thinking clearly, I was giving up a booming private practice. So all of a sudden, I lost all my adult friends, lost my wife, lost my identity, lost uh, my practice. All of a sudden, I'm back in Oregon. That's great. I'm close to my family. But uh, I just, I, everything I'd ever known as an adult was gone, stripped away can, in a matter can, can of we just Can we just sit there for a minute? So Certainly. I mean, I, I'm, I'm 37. I feel like, I feel like I'm so behind. I feel like, like I've wasted a lot of time. Like, yeah. um, like I, I can't possibly catch up. I know life is long, but I feel like I, that's the case. What, what kind of headspace were you in or, or how did, I guess, how did it feel to know that you had worked so hard for all of these things to have them ripped away from you? And, and not feel like you have any control over that. Yeah, absolutely agonizing. Because what I hadn't realized is uh, living in this small town, everybody knew Mary. And even 30 years later, I'd been a teacher there uh, for 20 years. And then I'd been a therapist there for 20. Um, and it, some of them overlap, so I'm not absolutely ancient. And... Uh, all of my adult identity uh, living in this small town since I wasn't a townie, since I was an outsider, and God forbid I was from the West Coast, uh, I, I was Mary's husband. Even after she died, they point to me and they're like, oh, there goes Mary's husband. And it just break me down because I thought, yeah, no, I'm not anymore. I wish I was. Uh, I was in such a foggy space. I, I felt so, for the first time in my life, I felt so out of control and so absolutely cheated. Uh, I had worked so hard and I felt like giving up so much. I mean, my favorite thing to do before I went to Kansas was climb mountains. I thought that's what I was going to do for a living um, or at least for a lot of adventure like my parents had. And uh, I don't know if you've been to Kansas, not so many mountains there. Uh, and so I'd given up what I'd felt was so much, even my family, who I dearly love and I'm very close to. And then it was like, I, I gave 30 years. And uh, before people were making bucket lists, uh, at the first of our relationship, we made what we called a have-to list. And there were 20 things on our have-to list. And when she died, guess how many we'd done? Um, five. Two. 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 You thought and you had more time? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. I love what I heard you say. I feel like I'm behind. And if you can take that feeling, Mark, and channel it, one of my favorite quotes is, to achieve anything great, this is by Leonard Bernstein, to achieve anything great, you only need two things, a plan 
and not quite enough time. And, <laughs> and the thing is, what most of us don't realize and what I didn't realize before this is we don't have enough time. We do not have enough time to just think we've got an unlimited number of days because we don't. And I feel on the inside, uh, unless I look in the mirror, uh, like I'm about your age. Uh, but then I'm like, I look at my social security card or my driver's license and I'm like, oh, no, I'm not. Uh, I got to get these things done. And so uh, going back to August of 2013, I'm down to 158 pounds. I, I've almost died four times in the last four years. I'd had these brushes with death and I had had many clients. Are you familiar with Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning? Um, I think I've heard, I think I've heard of him, but let's, let's you get You gotta it. read it. You gotta read it. Is that His the gentleman basic... who was in the um, concentration camp? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, Auschwitz. And he found that if a person had a purpose for living, uh, it didn't matter what they were like physically or even mentally, if they had, if they were passionate about this purpose and the more passionate you are, the more it helps you to stay alive and even come back. And I knew that because I'd helped several clients do that over the years, but I didn't care about anything. If I hadn't had a child, we'd probably not be having this conversation. I, at that time, I felt like I'd had a good run, done everything I'd wanted to do, created everything I'd wanted to create, and I was ready to go. But I thought, that's entirely selfish. I just can't do that. I got this little girl who just lost her mama. Uh, and, you know, she probably needs her dad. So I've got to give it everything. And then I thought, okay, while I'm waiting for life to answer me and for me to become inspired, I might as well clean up my duplex, maybe decorate it. I don't know. Make it comfortable. So I'm unpacking boxes. And I find a journal I was forced to keep in the sixth grade. And I thought, well, that's going to be interesting. Let's see what the 11-year-old Dean had to say. And on the front page, he said, when I get old, I got to. Not I got to. I got to. Climb Mount Everest, swim the English Channel. Hmm. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, I know I can't climb Everest because with my immune system, getting up in elevation, that's just not going to happen. But... I don't know why, Mark, but it was like, I'm going to swim the channel. I can do this. <laughs> Call it temporary insanity. I don't know what, but I just thought, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And the more I thought about it, the more excited I became. I told my oncologist, and he's like, not only no, but hell no, Dean. You get in a public pool and it could kill you. And I'm like, I'm dying already. And so I was just, I was skeletal and super sick, but I decided to get in the pool and I decided to do 10 laps. Were you not afraid? Like your doctor just said, don't do this. It will kill you. You say, listen, I'm dying anyway. I get that. I get the big picture. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm dying anyway. So, but, but there's the difference between I'm dying anyway along, you know, the way and I'm going to get in the pool and maybe next week. Um, I'm going to catch something. Something's going to happen. I'm going to be in the hospital and it'll be over. Like, <laughs> yeah. doesn't it feel more real? I remember when I, when I decided to propose to my wife 15 years ago, I remember the moment, I remember the moment I decided it was so exciting, but buying the ring, like writing the check, yeah. that's when it's real. It's not yeah. even the proposal that's real. Buying right. the ring is real. So I feel like it would be the same thing. You know, you're like, I'm dying anyway. I might as well get in the pool, but you're walking and you get your swim trunk on or whatever, you're walking with your, to the pool, you're putting your water, like that's, it's now real. Well, you're not it afraid? very real. Uh, yeah, but uh, this is an important part of the process that I think everybody needs to, to hear and to really consider. What are you more afraid of? And uh, thankfully, we we're able to keep my wife, Mary, home for those uh, 52 days but she ended up dying on our couch and I saw that happen. And my daughter saw that happen. And I thought, I'll be damned if I'm going to let my daughter see me die on a couch. Uh, it never occurred to me until I'm talking to you now. Well, if I had gotten sick, I probably would have ended up on the couch, <laughs> but I was more scared of that than of trying my best. 
and swinging for the fence. Um, one of my favorite quotes is by Mark Twain, find the right combination of confidence and ignorance and your success is sure. <laughs> and so I think I had that. I really do. And, you know, I've, I've been a lifelong lap swimmer uh, and I kicked off of that wall. It was like four years of agony just slipped off of me. And I'm like, I remember what it feels like to be me. This feels like me. Um, until about a lap and a half and I was out of wind and I had to rest. And it took me over an hour to do 10 laps. And I was so excited about getting just like a 25 meter, just a normal 25 meter pool. Yeah. 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 I was just in that bad of shape and that sick, yeah. but I wasn't going to quit until I had my 10 laps done. And this is why I was so excited to be on your podcast. We do the hard thing. One of the things my dad's always taught me is okay. Get to your limit. Then see if you can do one more. So I got to 10 it took me over an hour. I'm gasping and I'm like, no, got to do one more. So I did 11. And then I, every day I went back and did one more. I love that. So, so a bit of the, a bit of the premise here is, um, I feel super soft, man. You know, like, like I, I, I let's be honest, right. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a white guy in a free country <laughs> in, in, who grew up in kind of an upper middle class family. Now, you know, my yeah. background, you know, my bio. Yeah. So it's not like yeah. we don't have challenges or struggles. Right. Right. But, um, you know, I feel, I, I, I feel like I haven't experienced a fraction of the stuff that you've done. I haven't pushed as hard as almost anyone that I'm talking to on this podcast mm. has pushed. You know, I didn't have your dad, like I didn't, I, I had, I had other people, but I didn't have your dad to say like, you know, like, I'm going to push you so hard that you know what tired really feels like. And then you're going to do one more because yeah. that's what it really means. Right. And so, um, I guess just what a gift uh, your upbringing gave it you. It really so was. Way, so that way you're ready to face these things that you're facing now. Right. And that's why I say you don't choose your dreams. Your dream chooses you. Uh, I didn't know, but I was being groomed my whole life to do what I do. And uh, then as I started lap swimming, uh, the downside of that kind of grooming is you learn how to find that, what I call grit muscle, where you just dig deep and are able to kind of put it on autopilot and you just kind of soldier through things. And as I started uh, swimming more and more, the good news is my blood test, all, all my blood work started going in the right direction. I started developing uh, some muscle tone again, which was really nice. The downside is, uh, and this was one of the hardest parts of the journey, uh, it was so boring. Um, I, and it, it, it was so mentally tough to be that sick and get in the pool knowing I was going to swim 120 laps that day and be lap one. 119 to go. No, I, I used to be pounds heavier. I've lost yeah. 50 pounds over the last two wow. years. I need to do stuff that's, that's frankly pretty boring. And <laughs> so, so how did you overcome this? Like I'm going to put in the four hours or however long it takes you to do 120 mm -hmm. laps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or was the answer just jump in a lake? <laughs> yeah. Jump in a yeah. River? <laughs> yeah. Well, three things I found the first thing, and this has changed my life. Uh, never soldier through anything. Enjoy the beauty in everything. And that sounds like a bumper sticker. And so I just started thinking, how can I love each lap, each stroke, not leave my body and just be here? And so like you were talking about, I'd watch the bubbles. Uh, I'd see what would happen if I blew in different ways. Uh, it, it sounds super silly, but I guess it kind of was. I would actually just have fun uh, in the water. And then the other thing that I did is I found something that was really helpful. They're called bone conduction earphones. Have you heard of these? They're just pads that an MP3 player fits and, and they transfer the music, the sound waves through your cheekbones uh okay. as weird as it is for a 60 year old to love edm or rave music 
Um, yeah, I've kind of gotten into some of those groups. The third thing I did to help with that is I developed a mantra and it was um, the extraordinary becomes possible when you make it impossible to remain ordinary. The extraordinary becomes possible when you make it impossible to remain ordinary. So How do you not find yourself turning to, um, you know, uh, t- turning to alcohol, turning to drugs, turning to eating, turning to any of the things that um, that aren't really that bad? You know, everybody would forgive you, right? You know, in that situation. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah. How, how did that? How did you not succumb to any of those things? It's just not in your makeup, or it's never really been a part of my life and not a part of uh, my family life. My parents mm-hmm. were total teetotalers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never have seen my parents drink alcohol once. Um, they don't smoke cigarettes. Uh, yeah, it's just never been a part of my life. And then when I've seen the outcome, what happens, as a matter of fact, one of my doctors wanted to put me on an antidepressant uh, because I was so uh, grief stricken. And I know enough about grief. I don't want to dull that pain because it's nature's way. And so I wasn't going to turn to that. And But I really found very little then any kind of comfort or relief. Now, when I was swimming and, and chasing this dream, that's the most relief I found. But in order to make it impossible not to just lay there binging Netflix all day, I didn't have a TV. I I just had my uh, laptop. I would take my laptop right before I went to bed. I'd pack my swim bag. I'd go out to my garage. I'd put my uh, laptop under my swim bag in the passenger seat. And I couldn't get to my garage without going outside. And so in order to start binging, I would have to walk all the way out pick up my swim bag, knowing that I was a total jerk for doing so, get my laptop out, walk myself back in. And I did do that a couple times, but, but very rarely. Yeah. So, so flash forward, um, you know, you move from, from lap swimming and now you're in, in water, you're in cold water. Um, I, I, I want to, if I can flash forward to like yeah, yeah, yeah. some really kind of crazy things now. And I'm sure you'd laddered up, you know, but your, your first swim was uh, in Ireland, I believe, right? No, my first swim was here in Oregon, the Willamette okay. River. Yeah. And my first practice swim, in order for it to be counted as an actual recorded world record with the Open Water Swimming Society, all I can use is uh, a swimsuit, goggles, and a latex swim cap. So April 19th of 2014, I get in the Willamette and I'm going to do a pop off about five miles, my first practice swim. And I'm wearing nothing but a latex or not a latex, but Lycra jammers. And the late, I didn't even have a latex cap. I just had goggles and the water was 40 degrees. And I'm like, I- I'm a little tough. I can handle this. And I did for 23 minutes until I started having what's called hypothermic aspiration. I'd never, it was like somebody hit me right in the stomach and all my air would come out and I'd come up. Okay, cool. So you decided you want to do this. I I, I don't know why anyone would want to, but, but as you mentioned all your backstory, you know, the, the, the swimming, the adventurism and all this stuff. So, so how long, like when, when you're doing these swims now, how long are you swimming? How long are you in the water? Usually with the Willamette, I would start, try to be in the water by nine, try to be out of the water by six. So I am, I'm swimming eight hours, nine hours, sometimes 10 hours a day. Uh, and I get with the Willamette, it was so cold the first two weeks, it was 40 to, 40 to 44 degrees. And even with the three mil wetsuit, uh, I had... Uh, about six, five to six percent body fat at that time. And uh, I would have to get out about every 30 to 45 minutes, stand up on a riverbank and do burpees or run in place or jumping jacks uh, just to warm my body up so I could continue. Mm. And so I was swimming in uh, 40 degree water, eight to 10 hours a day, and uh, my breaks were not really breaks. They were 
uh, running in place or doing calisthenics to warm up. So it, it was it it was a lot mentally more than anything. So how how long into that at the time? I guess you, you know in your first, but and, and I imagine you still hit this place today. But how long did it take you to question why the hell are you doing it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yourself. I became so passionate about it, Mark, that I really didn't question it because like I told you, I started off with the English channel and then long about Christmas, I'm getting out of the pool and I thought, who cares if another middle-aged man puts on a Speedo and swims to France? It does the world no good. And in my case, it, it's definitely not going to be a pretty picture. So I started asking myself, what could I do that would be even bigger and do the world some good. Every day I'm tired, it's cold, the press is, has forgotten me, seems like no one cares, but I'm alive and I'm not in the hospital and I'm in Oregon and look at how beautiful this is and it would just get me energized. Uh, and then on those cold, rainy days, you think, what the hell am I doing? The one thing I always tell myself is, well, uh, if it was easy, everyone would have done it. And, or maybe at least one person in history. <laughs> so if I'm doing, if I'm the first person in history to do something, yeah, there's probably a reason. So go ahead and suck it up and be that first person. Yeah. You know, when, when, um, whenever I've been around people who are very outdoorsy, so, so I'm, I mean, I'm in, I'm in Toronto, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> like we, we, I, my wife and I went hiking actually, um, over the weekend, we went away for the weekend, okay. we went hiking nice. and, um, I, I was basically like running up the, the mountain. Um, yeah. I think it took us 18 minutes. So like, it's not <laughs> like, like we're talking basically ski hills, you know, that, <laughs> and not even yeah, your yeah, version yeah, of yeah, ski hills, yeah. our version, right. but, um, yeah. but but I, whenever I've talked to people, they've always talked about uh, the respect, um, like, you know, like respecting the river, but also the things that, that it teaches you, you know, like my great, my grandfather, sorry, um, was, was super into fishing. Um, and I just did not have the patience or, or the care for it, but he talked about like, you know, what you learned from the activity of doing so. So what has, have the rivers, I suppose, taught you? Oh man, so much. As a matter of fact, uh, the Willamette was so healing and I didn't, I didn't know anything about cold water immersion or Wim Hof before I got in the river. I didn't know anything about Wallace J. Nichols and his New York times bestseller, the blue mind and how they're using water as kind of the go-to treatment for trauma. I looked forward almost every day from about day 12 on to getting into the river because I felt almost, I've never told anyone this much, I felt almost as if I was being hugged. Like that river was just moving me and, and healing me. And uh, my, my family really noticed it. Before I got in, I got into the river June 3rd of 2014. I couldn't say Mary's name without crying. And when I got out uh, June 27th, uh, because I took every Sunday off to let my body rest, um, I was talking, having fun, having good memories about my life with her and my time in Kansas. And they're all looking at me funny. I'm like, what? They're like, you haven't talked about her without crying for four years. What's gotten into you? And I'm like, I don't know. I feel good. But I learned so much and it, it soothed me in uh, enormous ways. Did you find, so, so I, I've, I found this, you know, I, I believe that we all have something to prove to either the, the voice of doubt in our head or mm -hmm. um, those who doubt what we're doing. And I have on a few occasions in my life gotten really obsessed with something. And I imagine that when you decided that you are going to do these types of swims, you became pretty obsessed with it. Yeah. Uh, you must've had people who said, what are you doing? What are you talking oh. about? Why? Like, just, yeah. just be quiet about it. I'm tired of hearing about the rivers. I'm tired about hearing about <laughs> this. And, 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 and did, 
did that matter to you? How did you navigate that? Does that even matter? I kept very quiet. Um, I, I almost was like uh, closeted my dream. And I, I find that sometimes that's not a bad idea. There's that old saying, don't give your goals to the trolls. Um, I find that with uh, really big dreams, they have kind of a trajectory. If it's a huge dream, every, you're really going to start off on a very lonely journey. Everybody around you is going to be like, no, that's dumb. Don't do that. That's too big. And they'll tell you everything is wrong. But if you don't listen and keep going, at some point it hits a cumulative kind of tipping point. And then all of a sudden people start joining you. And then at the end, everybody's there saying, oh, we knew you could do it. I'm like, well, yeah, wait a minute. And so for about the first three months, uh, I mean, even my even these adventure parents try to talk me out of it. They, they're like, Dean, you got two forms of cancer. Uh, Dean, you got a daughter. Dean, this is stupid. And I'm like, yeah, I, I really want to do this. So I, for about the first three months, I didn't talk about it at all. Yeah, I just feel reckless or selfish. I mean, you know, those are, those are good points, right? You have, you, you have a, you know, 21 or 22 year old daughter, whatever it is at the time. And, um, and you know, she lost her mom and, you know, like, did, did it feel, did it feel selfish, reckless? Did you, were there any points where you questioned before, let's say? And uh, again, this might be my ignorance, Mark, but it was the exact opposite. Uh, you said most of us that do these big things are doing it to prove something. I wanted my daughter to, she was absolutely terrified I was going to die. And I thought if I can swim 187 freaking miles, she might calm down and think, okay, maybe dad's going to be around for a while. And if I didn't, if I only swam 100 and died, she still left with a better legacy than if I sat around being responsible. I'd been responsible all my life and it hadn't really gotten me. I mean, it got me a lot of success but it hadn't gotten me the richness and the satisfaction in life that I have now. So in these types of conversations, um, I, I love, I really appreciate you sharing. I love digging into these things, but I always come away going, you've got this figured out. Like you've, you found the answer. You've got this figured out, but I know that you have your up days and your down days and things work oh, out, and don't work yeah. out. And, you know, yeah. like just have to follow your Instagram feed to see sometimes things fall through. Well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but perhaps looking back, you're thankful for some of these challenges you face because they've turned you into who you are. Is, right. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah. And I really think it has to do with passionately following your dream. I mean, I knew it's, it was silly to start swimming. I've never been, unlike you, I've never been on a swim team. I've never won a swim race. Who am I to do this? But it just, I mean, I'm, I love history. I, I, one of my majors was uh, world history. And to think that I would be the first person in world history to have accomplished something, uh, that's, that's, for me, that's cool. Yeah. How do you make sure that you don't slip, you don't fall, you don't step back, that, that, the, that, the, that the impact of that life-changing moment and the things that you're doing, how do you not wander away from that? That, that worries me. That worries yeah. me that, you know, that the efficacy of that really impactful life moment won't just wear, wear off one day. Well, there are certain things that you do to keep yourself sharp and then uh, physically and mentally. And then there are certain things that you do to challenge your own paradigms. Uh, one of the things absolutely that happened in August of 13, almost at the exact same time I became passionate, is I ran across a quote by Albert Einstein. He said, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as if nothing is a miracle. The other is as if everything's a miracle. And when I read it, I was in such a sorry state that I slammed my laptop shut, almost broke the screen and cussed Albert out. Um, but it was what I call a Velcro quote. It just stuck to my heart and mind. And after a couple of days, I'm like, 
wait a minute, Dean, let's, let's face the obvious. Uh, it's, it's probably clear that Albert was a little smarter than you. Maybe you should think about adopting this for a little while, see how it turns out. The other thing is daily habits to kind of harden yourself because we all, like you were saying at the first, we all have become so comfortable and so safe and live in these climate controlled environments and, uh, you know, never threatened. And so you kind of got to threaten yourself. Um, one of the things I didn't tell you, I think you probably know by uh, looking at my Instagram is the first blood test after my swim, my leukemia was gone. And as near as they can figure it out, it was because I was in a constant state of hypothermia. And so once I started doing speeches after the swim, people asked me, hey, have you heard of Wim Hof? I'm like, no, but you're the fifth person that said that. So maybe I better look this guy up. There's so much science about cold water immersion. And so now I've partnered with this great group out of Scottsdale, Arizona, that builds cold water immersion tanks. And they sent me one that I've got in my garage. I keep it at 40 degrees. And yeah. That's cold. I, That's cold. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, hold on. How, like, like chin, like chin level? Yeah, or you're, six you're feet under? long, six feet long, three feet deep. And so I go down to here and then I'll hold my breath and go under for a minute or two, come back up, instant brain freeze. But you know, uh, this is a shout out to Tony Robbins. He brags about 57 degrees every yeah, morning. I know. I know. Yeah, he got nothing. 57 is balmy, baby. So um, it's funny because yeah. whenever I travel, like, you know, if I, I've, uh, if I've ever been to the, you know, the South or the Southwest, um, you know, like for example, I, like I'm up here in Canada, we don't use ice cubes and I never could understand people's obsession with ice cubes because yeah. if I turn yeah. on my cold tap, cold water comes out of the cold tap, not, <laughs> yeah. not lukewarm water, like, like pretty much cold, cold, cold water. Right. So then when I started hearing about people taking cold showers, and I'm like, really cold showers? So you go all the way to cold. It's really cold. <laughs> <laughs> Up there it has to be. It's yeah. really, really cold. And so uh, I've done it sometimes, but uh, I haven't yet. I mean, I, I've heard all of the positive, like all, all of the positive things about the different types of fats that you can build up and all of those things. But, but quite honestly, these skeptical medical physicians who are looking at these blood tests and are saying, well, it must be because of a constant state of hypothermia, but they still like, they, they, they must still think it was just happenstance, no? Like, are, are they really attributing the, your progress and cure to the cold water swimming? Oh, gosh, no. No, because the type They never of, admit it, right? No. That, he quickly recanted. I'm like, okay. really? He's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, well, you yeah. just said it. He's like, um, yeah, but no. And okay. uh, the type of leukemia that I had is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And everything in literature and science that you read, it says it never goes away. You just regulate it. And he said in his 30 years as an oncologist, he'd never seen it happen. Uh, but it happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two quick things, if I can. Sure. Um, sure. If, if you could bottle up everything that you've learned, um, if you could bottle up everything that you've learned along the way and be able to, you know, give it, give yourself it as a much younger age. Hmm. Um, let's say that, you know, you're talking to someone who's in their twenties, thirties, whatever it right. might be, right. bottling up all your knowledge and all your experience and everything that you learned. Um, what, what would you say to that person? What would you say to yourself? Basically two things. Uh, first thing is, uh, you know, I, uh, I guess three things. Um, the, the first thing is follow your dreams and your dreams inside of you. And it will have earmarks or little shadows um, all of your life. All of my life, I've jumped into rivers or alpine lakes and swam them. I've always wanted to swim something big. Uh, first time I saw the English Channel, I was 15. That day, I thought, okay, I'm going to swim this. And, and it's, it, it just has always kind of been there. Um, and so uh, when I've worked with other people and their dreams, their dreams always aren't the same as anybody else, but it always makes sense. They're like, oh, yeah, of course, that's me. So I guess that would be the first thing. But then the two other things that are the best to really develop toughness 
and be able to do the hard thing is first strike failure cleanly out of your vocabulary. A lot of people don't know, but failure is what's called a social construct. It's not natural to the human brain. It's something that's been developed over the years by culture. There is no such thing as failure, not even. We have to be taught the concept of failure, and then it has to be repeatedly reinforced hundreds of times before you believe it. If we believed in failure, none of us would have ever learned to walk or do any of the things we learn to do naturally because we failed hundreds and hundreds of times and replace it only with feedback. Every seeming failure or setback is just feedback. And if you're like, oh, okay, that didn't go so well, what is that telling me? Rather than, oh, gosh, I, I screwed it up. I'm done. I failed. I, I'll never be able to do that. Um, that's, that's one of the biggest ways I think people let go of their dreams and a wonderful life and accomplishing anything is believing in failure. The third thing is my three-step approach to any big adventure, anything in life. And I coalesced everything I've learned from watching thousands and thousands of people for three decades because I had to when I did the River Shannon. The River Shannon was so hard, it made the Willamette, even though I had two forms of cancer, look like a cakewalk. I coalesced everything I've learned in order to do it. The first one, step one is face your fear. Okay, you're scared. Uh, maybe there's a good reason you're scared, but don't let that stop you. Second step is the way you face your fear is just take the next step. And so every day I just ask myself, what's the next step? Well, get up and eat breakfast. What's the next step? Get to the river. What's the next step? Put on your wetsuit. What's the next step? Just start swimming. <laughs> okay. And, and then the third step is after you've taken the step, just enjoy it. Just be there and enjoy life. So it's face your fears by taking the next step. And then just enjoying every minute of it. And I found as I started to live that way, it's insanely simple. And it constantly keeps you moving forward in a very relaxed, confident way. And I've, I've encouraged many, many people to start living that way. And I've gotten a lot of feedback that different ages, races, cultures, genders, it's kind of a universal way of going about things. Dean Hall, man, you are extraordinary and an inspiration. So thank you so much yeah. for, uh, for sharing and for opening up and, um, and being willing to, to just share all the experiences you had. I really appreciate it. Well, Mark, I can't tell you how uh, proud I am, uh, number one, to get invited to a show like this, but number two, that you, especially your age, have already figured out that doing the hard thing is doing the right thing. And, and then putting that message out, especially in a culture that says, take the easy way out. So I'm really proud of you too. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Whew. Wasn't that something? Wasn't that an empowering interview? Dean's story, I mean, it just reminds me that we can all overcome the hard things, especially in the darkest times. Okay, key takeaways for me. Number one, focus on what's enjoyable, even when you're doing those difficult and hard things. Number two, when you think you've reached your limit, you have to find a way to exceed it and then get up and do it all over again tomorrow. Now, it's harder for us to live that than it is for me to say that right now. And then the third thing is that the amount of passion that you have for your dreams will directly affect your ability to actually achieve those very dreams. So living in fear, listening to the voice of doubt in your own head, it will keep you standing still and standing still is death. I want to remind you, switching gears, please check us out on Apple Podcasts, rate and review us. If you're not a subscriber, be sure to subscribe. If you want to reach out to me directly, just follow me on IG and you can DM me. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, they can, we can show ourselves and the world that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You have to be bold. And you must say yes, because we do hard things.